coming up in this vlog. my channel if you're new here my name is Renee I'm a doctoral researcher at Royal Holloway University of London it is morning here in the UK so I'm in the UK it's morning here it is Saturday the 26th of March 2022 and we are getting ready to go to Leicester I'm going to Leicester I think for the very first time no actually I've actually been to Leicester before but very passing but this will be, we'll say my first time in Leicester. I've been invited to a book festival. I was invited by Dr. Anthony Joseph, who is going to be chairing a panel at this book festival. And I'll be on the panel alongside Kimberly Redway, who's a children's and young adult um, author. And I'm so excited. The panel is entitled Black, British and Writing. All of the things that I am, all of the things that I love, and so it should make for a really interesting discussion. But I'll be filming the entire journey. So getting ready with me, you know, breakfast, outfit, all of that stuff. Um, the road trip, the road trip, fun fact. So Dr. Anthony Joseph, I've actually never met him before, but I'm friends with his daughter. But the funnest part of this fact is that I knew of Dr. Anthony Joseph's work before I was even friends with his daughter. So anyways, his daughter will be coming um, to pick me up, I think at 12.30. She's coming to drive us to Leicester. Anyways, let's go. guys it's come just in time literally just before about to leave um my new tripod came i broke my old tripod it was a you know just a, a cheap plastic tripod that you can get from amazon so i decided to invest a little bit and buy a more high-tech tripod i really feel like i'm going to struggle with this but this is the ho-hum gimbal it's the three axis handheld stabilizing gimbal Okay, so I'm ready. Nice little cropped white shirt, puffy sleeve. Just need to put my shoes on, get my bag, and then we can go. I don't know, anybody from Leicester, you guys can let us know if we're saying it right. But it's saying a five minute walk, guys. We made it. We found the building. So this is the Cleffin building, the Arts and Humanities building.
What I want to do today is, of course, speak to Kimberly and Renee about their views on, on Black British writing and what that is, to have them read a bit from their work and then to invite any sort of questions that people want to have at the end. A researcher in the School of Humanities at Royal Holloway, University of London. Her research interests include literary and critical theory, Caribbean neo-slave fiction, Black British writing, and eco-criticism. She's currently writing a PhD thesis entitled Re We Run Things. 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 We <laughs> Run Things, a post-colonial eco-critical study of Caribbean neo-slave narratives. Uh, alongside the research, Renee is also a multi-award winning founding director of Beyond Margins UK, which is a, a race, equity and justice movement. She's also the co-founder of Black in Arts and Humanities, a global online network of black scholars and practitioners. Kimberly Redway was born in Birmingham and she currently works at, for the IT department at West, Mid West Midlands Police. She's an avid reader and achieved a BA Honours in Creative Writing with English Literature in 2010 from EMU, from Grand Rivia, so this is her alma mater. She graduated in 2020 with a Master's in Management and Entrepreneurship from BCU. She has published two children's, she's published two children's books, Misfit, which is published by Bloomsbury, and Count Your Blessings, which was published by HarperCollins. Uh, she's also been involved in two literature projects which include Objection to Perfection, an anthology, and Caucasus Profession. I want to give a bit of historical context first to why we're here. I mean, the fact that we have a panel discussing Black British writing means something. It means that it's, it's seen as something distinct from everything else. You know, you don't, I've never seen a panel on white British writing. So I thought it'd be really interesting for you guys to hear Dr. Anthony talk a little bit about the history of Black British writing. So, what is the history of Black British writing? Where does it start? Well, Black British writing has to start, if we look at a historical point, it has to start with the abolition of slavery. Because prior to that, slaves were not educated or didn't have the skills or the, the access to literature that makes you a writer. So you cannot say that it started before the late 1800s. Although uh, someone like uh, Equiano, who published his uh, slave narrative in eight, 1789, is quite an anomaly. Prior to him, there was really nothing going on. Then after him, it took a long time before there, there was anything like Black British writing. The first sort of outpouring to this started in the 1930s with people like C.L.L. James and, uh, and Guyanese writer called Edgar Mitzahola, who published probably about 12 novels in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and then, after that, we have people like Samuel Selborne in the 50s, B.S. Naipaul, George Lamming, and that whole generation of which people like Derek Walker is part of, um, who else, who am I forgetting, Una Marson, Jamaican poet, People like that, 30s, 40s, 50s, there was a boom because suddenly there were a lot of Caribbean people here. After a brief introduction about its history, we then had a group discussion about what Black British writing means to us. I wanted to start with you guys and just ask you, um, what does that term mean to you? What, what does Black British writing mean to you? In school, and this is a, you know, a general problem with the British education system, is that we're not taught much about our history. The books and the novels that we are to read, Mice of Men, or To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, the kind of narratives that we're so familiar with. But I say it's, I'm conflicted, because when I think of the term Black British, and then we'll come to writing, but I can't help but ignore the hyphen that's in the middle, and my own hyphenated identity with which has given me a kind of crisis of identity. What I mean by that is, for instance, I'm a black British Caribbean woman. Uh, and the hyphens are between black and British, and there's another hyphen between British and Caribbean. And the hyphen kind of tells me that you are either part of something, so only a part of something, or you're not this thing at all. It's never that you're fully this. So for instance, um, 
the term black. We can liken that with African uh, heritage. But because of Caribbean slavery, I bear the last name of an enslaver. I don't, I don't have access to my African indigenous name. Neither do I know or have knowledge of where my family originated from. So I'm removed from Africa, is what I'm trying to say. Now, being British, even though I was born in Britain, my skin uh, sort of disqualifies me. For instance, I don't know if anybody else in here has ever experienced, um, you know, encounters where somebody says to you, go back to where you, you, you've come from. Now, I was born in Britain, so it's kind of like a funny one to kind of navigate that. So my skin and maybe even my ethnic features disqualify me from being wholly British. And then there's Caribbean. I was born in Britain, and so I'm black, British, and Caribbean, but all of these parts of my identity don't really want to accept me or embrace me. I feel other or outside. And the hyphens now, coming back to black British writing, are kind of almost a reminder of that. It's like, well, are you black? Are you even British? And then to write. Generally, there's this erasure, this lack, this displacement, this, you know, uh, segregation, and all of these things are the reasons why I'm so conflicted with this term. I think it's a necessary term because it gives us a place, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's just this kind of reminder that who are you mm -hmm. in terms of your identity? Who, who, who are you? Where and how do you belong in this space? So unfortunately, we lost some footage of us discussing further on that question, but let's now skip to Kimberly Redway, who's going to be reading from one of her books. So it's called, I Can't Work, Confessions of a Bounty. I want to live in a world where my hair isn't a political statement, where I don't wear weak because I want to look white, or have dreadlocks because I want to rebel against the establishment. Isn't it enough to want you to look pretty? Isn't it enough to daydream about a world where other races, one in particular, don't touch my hair without permission and announce that maybe you should have it relaxed? So and so does, and it looks nice. I want to live in a world where I'm not defined by my skin colour, where my achievements aren't considered unusual or revolutionary. Isn't it enough to just want to be smart? Bounty, black on the outside and white within. Is that my description because I prefer rock to rap, K pop? to black British music and MTV bass to M um, MTV hits to MTV bass. Not that I can afford it either. I'm aware of the struggle, Jim Crow law, segregation, slavery, and the present struggle regarding upward mobility, particularly where I live in the UK. We don't live in a colourblind world, but I do, I truly believe that white privilege exists. Do I wish to speak about the fact that my skin colour can keep me from a certain way of living? Maybe that's one for the next opinion piece. that angry black woman, yet when you let things slide for fear of being that person, you become absent in your own life. Should you be considered a bounty for not wanting to promote your cause, for fear of sticking out rather than fitting in? And should I spend my days seeking posts on Tumblr that declares that Frozen is racist? Is it wrong to dislike the princess in the frog? To become annoyed that you live in a world where you're reluctantly catered to, <laughs> rather than fairly represented? Does it even matter to young black girls that were an afterthought? So what is a bounty to do? Don't a rap, constantly speak about roots. Should I just get a play line <coughs> and the fairness I'm surrounded by? Or should I immerse myself in the sounds of Taylor Swift? Should I consider the cultural appropriation of twerking? Should I complain about other races adopting practices that are considered rational for me to do? It seems the best thing to do is to start a dialogue, to encourage discussion about the struggle, because it isn't just going to go away. Yet the problem is not helped by labeling others who appear to be unfazed by the struggle of bounties. Instead, the better use of our time might be to celebrate difference and in turn maybe teach others about the, this approach to different cultures. We live in a time of social media revolution, the signing of petitions and the realisation that marching seems to be largely ignored by those who need to change. The best we can do is to rise up mediocrity and to present a new way of life. We need to unite and teach one another about how to approach the problem. Well, that's enough about revolutions and change. I must admit, here we go, and for a bounty, I'm not taste it one. <laughs> <laughs> Bearing in mind that this panel discussion was just one session or event that was going on across this 
Triple Day Book Festival. I was invited to do something that I've never quite done before, which was a public reading of my work. I had the option to read something creative, so either a poem that I wrote or a short story, or something critical like an essay. And I opted for the latter because I'm more confident in that area of sharing my work. Um, So I'm going to share with you guys just a little snippet of a lyric essay that I wrote on paradise, the Caribbean and naming. I hope you guys enjoy it. Naming is largely uh, considered to be an effectual act of formation, following Adam's mandate from God to name the animals in the Garden of Eden. Philo describes this Adamic act of naming as an Edenic linguistic triumph, which is superior to any other theory of a language's origin. European colonizers like Columbus believed that they were in fact the ones who could possess uh, the power to perform what God and Adam made possible, which was creation out of nothing. They assumed upon their arrival that the Caribbean had no history, or culture, or identity. In this sense, the Christianizing, the civilizing, and renaming project was based upon an epistemology imparted with the notion of creation out of nothing. And though Adam's naming is said to have allowed animals to have you know, a true identity and, and the freedom to be, in the colonial project, naming is rooted in a kind of nomination that expresses its destructive uh, and oppressive abilities. Colonizers felt as though they could create the Caribbean in their image and in their likeness. This was to be the second coming of the Caribbean and the creation of a new world paradise. With the replacing of ind- indigenous names, place names, came this kind of paradisiacal or paradise uh, mythologization of names. So for instance, uh, the name Dias Dominica, which is a place in the Caribbean, translates as the Lord's Day. Uh, Valle de, del Pariso means Valley of Paradise. Even the name Trinidad represents the Holy Trinity. Uh, Colonialists sought to baptize the landscape so that it takes on the name and identity of Jesus and Europe linguistically. It is this colonial construction of the Caribbean as a paradise which has transformed the region into a zone of delight, you know, free from human anxieties, a site of exploitation and consumption. In short, that essay explores how European colonisers weaponised Christianity, a faith which encourages peace and unity and love, and instead they moulded it and refashioned it towards their own oppressive goals and objectives. It looks at the erasure of indigenous Caribbean place names and argues that we can reverence the indigeneity of the land by remembering. We must reinstate power in the land by responding to its size and its yearnings for a life fashioned out of clay. The most important thing about clay, I believe, is not that it represents the earth, home or place, but that it symbolizes change and uh, transformation and pliability. But the beautiful thing about remembrance is that it positions us in the past. As such, we can look back to when the rocks were once clay when these places were identifiable by their indigenous names. We can now not only acknowledge the cultural heritage of the land, but we can also recover it through memory. The audience were amazing. We then opened for some questions, which really took the conversation on Black British writing to a new level. It was a wonderful session. I also got to see some people who I greatly admire in the audience. So after that, I said a quick hello to them. We had a little look around the book festival and then a drive through Leicester. So let's get on to the next part. So guys, we've just finished our session. You've just seen snippets of, you know, moments from the talk. But I have to introduce you to Dr. Anthony Joseph. Oh, hello. Hi. Um... Yeah, Tell me who you are. Tell me what you do. Um, He's also no, a musician. I'm, just, I'm Anthony Joseph. You can find me online. 
But no, it was amazing. It was amazing working um, with Renee and, and Kimberly. I hope we can do it again in a bigger context. Yes, absolutely. So I was just telling his daughter on the way here that he's a big deal. Can I just say also that in the audience, somebody who I follow on Twitter whose work is incredible, they are incredible, turned up at the event and I, I want to introduce him to you guys. This is Trey. Hi. Tell them what you do, tell them about your work. Um, so, creative writer, I do a lot of spoken word performance poetry in terms of like black history, race, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. Also a lot of uh, historical work as well, historical academia. Um, so historical writing into Windrush, slavery and that, all, all that sort of stuff as well. Um, and then also political activism. Where can people find your work? Um, so search me on Instagram, so at Trey Ventor Ed, uh, you'll find, and that's the same on Twitter as well. Yeah. And just Google search Trey Ventor and you should get a whole um, list of things. Amazing. I'll leave your links on the screen here. Yeah. But it's so lovely to meet you. You too. <laughs> So I didn't get a chance to speak to Kimberly Redway at the end of the event, but I will leave her details for social media, as well as Dr. Anthony Joseph's and anything else that I've mentioned throughout this vlog that I said that I was going to put in the description will be in the description. If you're not subscribed already, you will be missing out. The next vlog you'll see is me going to Liverpool. I'm going to Liverpool to visit the International Slavery Museum as well as a bunch of other museums and art galleries I show you around Liverpool. It's an awesome vlog so you want to subscribe right now. <laughs> see you next time.